look myself in the mirror and accept that if you weren't a racist, you condone what a racist did. So that's to me the same thing. It's the same thing. So I, I agree with you completely. Sounds to really make you rub and scrub. Swing barang barang bong billy billy bong. Bong billy 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 bong. I said, pass the dutchy from the left hand side. Pass the dutchy from the left hand side. It's a go bon. Anthony, welcome to the show. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. You, you uh, got a big show, you got a big following. So uh, God bless you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Both of you, welcome to the show. I greatly appreciate you coming on. Thank you, thank you, and good morning. The right, floor is yours. Good job. Whatever it is, it'll keep till the morning. How about we both got better things to do? Midnight blue Time on your side I still care I may have died But I come nowhere Just think of me I'll be there Just think of me I'll be there There you go Bit rusty <laughs> you know what? I gotta, I gotta tell you. Usually, I make my guests get a little emotional if I find something that touches them. You got me this time. So, viewers, you're always telling me you got this one emotional. That got me emotional. I don't uh, it's not since you told me you've seen some of the shows already. Welcome, Johnny. Of course, you know the running joke on my show is because you're six hours ahead of me. Oh yeah. I need the lottery numbers. But what do you mean? These ones. <laughs> I'm one step ahead of you, man. Hey, folks, the man with the pinky ring and the New York thing, forget about it, Bad Brad Berkwood, and you're watching another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report web TV channel. Now make sure you hit that button, whatever corner it's in, and subscribe, leave your comments below. Let's have a conversation, all right? As well, follow me on Twitter. My handle is at BadBradRSR. Again, at BadBradRSR. Well, today, folks, is Monday, and it's cold here in St. John, Indiana. We were supposed to get snow all last night, but believe it or not, it tapered off a little bit. But hey, through the snow, we still go on. On my show today, I have a special guest all the way from the East Coast who's dealing with snow as well, I'm quite sure. She is a Republican commentator on CNN, very, very popular. And my guest today is Alice Stewart. All right. Well, first of all, I want to welcome you to the show, Alice. I appreciate you coming on. Great to be with you, Brad. There's a lot going on, that's for sure. For there, sure. There definitely is. There definitely is. Uh, before we started shooting, I want my viewers to take notice. She's got that old school camera up there. That's just really cool. I like that. Do you, do you collect cameras? Actually, those were my aunt's. Um, she collected them and she had uh, several of them. And, and when she passed on, that was one of the uh, things I got was a collection of her old uh, cameras. And, and they're just really, it's really fun to to see them and, and of all the things that I have in my background, that's one of the things I get a, most of the comments uh, on those cameras. So it's kind of neat. That's cool. Well, before we get into the Q and A and all that, I want to tell you, I got a text from a young lady that said she wanted some camera time. Now I want to show you who this young lady is and have you tell the viewers, this young lady right here. That, that would be Sammy. <laughs> Sammy loves her camera time. She loves <laughs> photographs. Um, but she, she's good. She's been playing in the snow a lot, so she's really tired. <laughs> she a Sam, she's a little shit zoo. She's yeah. over there to the side. She's making sure that I, I don't get anything wrong. So she, okay. she keeps an eye. And I, it's, I'm better off keeping her up here. 
upstairs because if she's downstairs, she's in the front window. And whenever the, the UPS or the FedEx truck drives by, she barks. So she I barks. keep her up here by my feet. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, we may hear my two, Bella and Santino, in the background barking. Uh, what I always like to do is start out with, because I talk to people all around the world, um, how are you dealing with, how are you coping with COVID in your area? Everyone's been really smart and, and, and safe. Uh, you know, I moved into a new home right when COVID hit last year, so it was quite an adjustment. But I, people are, you know, respectful of, of other people. We've had a few folks in the, the neighborhood that have uh, been in contact with it. Um, and one person did come down, uh, was exposed and did get COVID. But everyone's been very respectful um, in terms of over the holidays. I, I went to my family in Atlanta and everyone had been tested. There's a lot of college kids, uh, my nieces and nephews, and everyone had been tested and, and used precautions. But in terms of my, you know, friends and family group, people are, are very respectful. If someone decides that they want to bow out of an invitation at the last minute, we, you know, we certainly understand. And, you know, at first everyone kind of avoided each other and, and wore masks when they were around each other. But, but now I feel like um, people are a little more, um, careful uh, about it in some ways, but, but also they're, they're trying to get back to a point where they can um, safely socialize. And I'm not saying not being careful, but getting back to where they're a little bit more social, but also being mindful of wearing masks and socially distancing and washing okay. your hands and being careful. Okay, great. What I like to do with my interviews is start at the beginning, work forward, uh, give my viewers a 360 of you. So it's not just the political stuff and where we may agree and disagree and all that, that's fine. But as well, I want them to get a, a vision of you. So there'll be all kinds of questions mixed in. Um, let's start out like this. From my research, bye-bye. From my research, it looks like you were born in Atlanta, Georgia. Is that correct? Right, um, 29 years ago, that's correct. <laughs> there you go, that's what I like. That. Okay. I love a sense of humor. A girl can always dream. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's all right, that's all right. We're from the same generation. I'm, I'm, but actually, I'm only 22. So what was it, for the viewers, what was it like growing up in Atlanta? It, it was great. I, I um, was a huge Braves fan. I uh, liked the Falcons, but they weren't very good. But we, we were a very athletic family. We had, uh, I have a brother and two sisters, and we were, um, you know, lower middle class kind of family. Mother was a nurse and uh, it, we just were very active. And this was, you know, pre, you know, cell phones and, and computers and we played sports and very active. Uh, I wasn't the greatest student. I worked hard, but uh, I wasn't the greatest student in terms of it didn't come naturally. But, you know, looking back growing up, it was, um, it was more fun and, and social and, you know, athletics, uh, whether it was playing softball or swimming or running uh, or any of the sports we did. I think, I think that generation, but certainly my family and my neighborhood and friends, uh, sports was a, was a big way to socialize. And I think it's a, it's a big character builder. And, you know, again, as I said, being, being a Braves fan, that they were horrible when we were growing up, but we just loved going to the games. We'd have the whole, you know, section in the outfield all to ourselves. but, you know, watching, you know, Hank Aaron and Dale Murphy and uh -huh. uh, Al Roboski and those greats, it was, um, that, that's the, that's what I think about when I think about growing up. Okay. My better half, Debbie, is a uh, Atlanta Braves fan. She's from Louisiana, but she's an Atlanta Braves fan. And I can't remember, she's got a jersey. I can't think of the name of the baseball player. She just left, but uh, she liked the Braves as well. Um, were your parents political? You don't have to give me all personal stuff, but were they? Did, were you around politics when you were young? Not at all, not at all. I, and it just, it, no other reason that, you know, they, they worked hard and raised four kids and, you know, they certainly didn't have the time to, to be involved in politics. Uh, I do remember one time uh, one c candidate came by the house doing some door to door knocking and my mother, you know, invited him in and they had coffee and talked, but that was the only thing I remember. Uh, I will say this, one of my, my good friends growing up, her mother was very involved in politics 
And my very first campaign I ever worked on was Jimmy Carter's campaign. Uh, when he was running for president, she and I would go down to the CNN Center in Atlanta where his headquarters was and make coffee and cookies for all the volunteers. So <laughs> my, that was my, my first foray into politics was, you know, as a very, very young, young child um, doing that. So that, you know, that was kind of how I got into politics. And then as I got into to college is, is when I got got more involved. Okay, just out of curiosity, did you watch that cool documentary that your network had, CNN, uh, The Rock and Roll President? That was great. Was you know, and it's, it's, yeah, and it's funny how he, he acknowledged how, you know, the, the music industry and, you know, the, the band members really helped, uh, you know, make him cool, but yeah. also increased his name ID and, and helped him to raise money. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, Politics and music make strange bedfellows, but it does work. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I had a laugh when he talked about Chip and Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson wouldn't say that it was Chip that he smoked the joint with. And, yeah. and, and President Carter said, oh, it was Chip. Yeah, <laughs> it was no like, doubt. I and, thought it was hilarious. Yeah, okay. No kidding. It looks like you obtained your journalism and political science degree from the University of Georgia Grady School of Journalism. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Okay. And, and, and that was majored in broadcast news, minored in political science. And back then we had just started a, a television um, a news show at the, at the university and my professor, David Hazinski, who I love and still stay in touch with, uh, was very instrumental in my love of television and love of news gathering. And back then it was the days of heavy equipment and, you know, mm -hmm. cameras and tripods and lights. And, um, you know, you really had to work hard to, to be a one man band and get a story done. But I, I loved doing that. But politics, e even then, it was an interest for me, but I wasn't involved because I, I really felt, Brad, that as a journalist, being fair and impartial, I, I wasn't involved in politics. I didn't, um, you know, show my stripes uh, at all because I, I felt as I got into journalism, I was a news anchor um, throughout my beginning of my career. I, I needed to, to keep that, you know, in the back, you know, in the back burner. And I, I really concentrated as a journalist to be fair and impartial and give both sides to the story. And um, that was a big part of it. While I loved politics and, and I lo actually loved court cases and I was, you know, law was a big uh, passion of mine as well, but uh, I tried to keep them separate until I made the, the transition into politics. But uh, I feel like I was um, pretty, in terms of being a journalist, you know, the being impartial was truthful and factual and impartial was a, a huge uh, priority for me during that part of my career. Okay. Just out of curiosity, it wasn't even a question on the paper, but because it's so, it's in the media right now about student loan debt. Um, when you graduated, were you, did you face that did you, with student loan debt from college or? I didn't because I paid my own way through school. Okay. I saved money in high school. I worked four jobs in college. Um, I, I worked at the radio station. I worked at the newspaper. I taught aerobics. I w <laughs> worked at Red Lobster. Um, I remember at the very end, I had to, to borrow uh, $2,000 from this woman's uh, organization. And I quickly, as soon as I graduated, I got an internship in Atlanta, I paid and I, I paid it back. But I was fortunate, I, I guess, fortunate in that I, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wasn't going to have a free ride. And um, th back then in Georgia, they didn't have the, the, the big scholarships like they do now as right. part of the, the lottery scholarships. Um, so you either your parents paid for it, you paid for it, or you had a big uh, debt. But um, it, it is an issue. And, and I, I do think it's something that, um, you know, needs to be dis discussed and talked about. I see it with a lot of my, my Harvard students now and, and how, how to pay for things. But I was fortunate in that, um, fortunate, I guess, that I, I worked my butt off. Um, but it kept me more focused on my school, knowing that, you know, the the more I apply myself, the, the sooner I'll get done and the less the bills will add up. Okay. Now, it looks like you be you began your career as a weekend anchor on NBC Little Rock affiliate KARK. Is that correct? Well, my first job was before that. I worked okay. in Savannah. Yeah, okay. I, I was in Savannah. I was a producer and a reporter and an anchor. I also did the weather. Um, and so it was kind of, it was a 
great station. It was WTOC. It was the Big Red 11. It was a, the powerhouse station in Savannah. And it, Savannah is such a, a beautiful city to, to live in. And, you know, we were able to cover, you know, South Georgia as well as parts of um, South Carolina as well. And so that's where I, you know, really um, started off in terms of loving politics. I covered a lot of courts and crime um, and state fairs and um, th that kind of thing. But okay. that was, that's where I, I first got, got into it. And um, then I moved to, to Little Rock. I actually moved to Little Rock when the Whitewater trials were going on and the grand jury was going on in Little Rock. And that was my big kind of reason for going there. I was going to go and, and cover the Whitewater trials and um, launched my big national television career <laughs> that didn't okay. work but uh, but that was kind of what kind of what drew me to Little Rock at, at first but then I, I grew to love Little Rock as well okay now when you were in Little Rock that's when at some point you transitioned and I, I believe the first campaign you worked on was uh, was the governor at the time or, w or was he a private citizen Mike Huckabee he was governor at the time. This was this would have been around 2006. I'd been an uh, anchor in, at the TV station in Little Rock for about seven years. And then uh, Governor Huckabee was governor at the time. He had an opening as a communications director. And I, that's when I jumped into, um, into politics. And this, he had about a year and a half in the governor's uh, office, and then he ran for president. And I was his communications director on the, that presidential campaign. So that's when I made the transition uh, into, okay. into politics. Okay, I would be remiss if I didn't go back to something you said a little bit earlier, that you worked on President Carter's campaign. So obviously we know President Carter was a Democrat. <laughs> you, I, don't, I don't know if, if currently, if you're still, you're still a Republican, correct, right now? I am, right, okay. right. And I've worked so, a communications director for, you know, four presidential campaigns, five actually, um, right. and all, all, all Republican, yes. All Republican. Were you ever, just out of curiosity, were you ever a registered Democrat or you just worked on President Carter's campaign when you were I, younger? I did. Of course, I was a kid and I was okay. just going there to help out, just making coffee and, and okay. cookies. But um, no, I've always always been conservative Republican. And an interesting thing, when I, when I did go to work for Governor Huckabee, there was a lot of Democrat politicians in Arkansas who were surprised because they thought I was a Democrat just because right. just I, I try to be a lot like you, Brad. I, I think you have a, a genuine interest in people and you have a genuine desire to have thoughtful conversations and uh, a kind nature. And I, I kind of try to be that way. I, I don't look at people as their party first. I look at them as a person first. And I feel that I conveyed that as a reporter. And so a lot of people were surprised that I was actually a, a, a Republican just because I have tons of friends that are, are Democrats and right. politics is not a, a factor in terms of uh, personal conversations and, and relationships. Okay. Um, this part of the interview, I want to go into, actually, I'm going to have some of your quotes because I want to ask you questions off of that. Um, but in 2016, we'll start out with it like this. In 2016, you were hired by CNN to be a political analyst. I read in an article in the Arkansas uh, Democrat Gazette about your new gig. You said, and I'm quoting, obviously I don't want Hillary Clinton to win and I'm going to praise Donald Trump when he does the right things and when he's on message, but at the same time as a commentator, like you said earlier, it's my role to call a spade a spade whenever need be. Now, I got a note here because that's why I want to interview you because I've seen you on quite a bit. We're on different sides of the political spectrum. But what I respect about you, Alice, um, at least for me, I only speak for me, is that I do see, even though I disagree with, with some of your views and you probably disagree with mine as well, I'm cool with that. But I do like the fact that you call something out because not everybody does that, you know, whether, right. they're, re whether they're Republican or Democrat. And I, and I have issue with that on both sides. I feel if it's wrong or if you, in your opinion, you feel it's wrong, you need to say it's wrong, regardless of what party it is, regardless of who the candidate is or if they're in power. And I, I have seen you do that. I commend you. Um, well, thank you, Brad. And I, I think that's important. I think it's important on, on both sides of the aisle. And I could go down a, a laundry list of, of the things I've said, you know, in support of the former president and, right. and in opposition to him, because right. I, I feel like I'm a Republican for the policies and not the personalities. I, right. I'm not into the, the cult of personality. I'm into the the foundation of principles of a Republican. And, you know, personalities will come and go, but the principles of the party are, are not going away. And that's where I am. Okay. 
the one other point I want to make, like I said, I'm going to have some things where I'm going to read some stuff that you said, and then I want to talk to you, you know, to, as a talking point and get your side. What I want to preface this with is I don't attack my guests. We're on, we're, like I said, we have different political views, but if I didn't uh, have respect for you, I wouldn't have you on my show. So I don't want you to think like, oh God, okay, Brandon's now he's attacking. That's, that's not my way of interviewing people. I want to, uh, like I said, I want to read what you said because I don't want to miss, I don't like being misquoted myself. Right, right. So what I want to ask you about, start out with, in a Harvard Political Review article dated December 30th, 2020, uh, you said during an the interview, there are people who are supportive of Donald Trump and there are never Trumpers. I support the president, but there are a lot of things I don't agree with regarding his tone and demeanor, and I call him out when it is necessary. I don't, ever, I don't think everything that he does is great, and I don't think everything he does is bad. With that talking point, what I want to ask you is, you talked about tone and demeanor. I never liked his tone and demeanor. I thought it was completely unprofessional. Uh, let me, as you know, you researched me a little bit. I'm 20 years and 28 days in the military. I'm very respectful of women. I was brought up by uh, my dad, who was very respectful of women. I, I don't like misogyny, that trait. I don't like belittling people. We can have a difference of opinion. Now, if somebody attacks me, I'm going to stand up for myself. But I, right. don't, I don't believe in misogyny. I don't believe in calling insults. I don't, you know, I, I just, it's, it's not my thing. When you talked about tone and demeanor, looking back on the Trump presidency with many of the things that he said, which I'm sure, and, I, and I've heard you not agree with it, but looking back now that he's out, that he's not in front of the bully pulpit, have you reassessed anything that, I know you agree with a lot of his policies, but did you reassess and say, now watching like the, uh, the trial and all these things that, you know, clips that come out, which I know you've seen them way before I ever saw them in your line of work. Have you reassessed um, that his tone and demeanor, in my opinion, was a huge detriment to uh, anything that he was trying to do um, for policy and everything else. What, what is your take on that? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I agree a hundred percent with with that. And and look, the the self inflicted wounds that he created for himself and the administration were more damaging than anything else that um, he he could have done. Really, a lot of um, legislation that he wanted to get done, a lot of the policies that could have been done in a bipartisan way, were taken off the table because uh, of his tone and demeanor and not just the way he treated Democrats. I mean, he was awful and hateful right. and dis said disgusting things about Republicans. Yeah. And that's just unnecessary. And, and look, I, I've, I've said this all along. I, I I'm supportive of his policies. I, I worked um, re really, really hard for someone else to be the Republican nominee in 2016. I worked really hard. So I, I, I can at least say I wasn't riding the Trump train from the very beginning. I, I fought like heck um, for Ted Cruz. And Ted was the last man standing before uh, Donald Trump. Of course, there's another story there. But um, I, it took me a long time to, to finally get to the point to where I will say, okay, I'm gonna support this president. But it was only for, this, for the reason he was the Republican Party's nominee. I supported what he was doing with regard to um, policies with you know, law and order, but the Supreme Court was uh, an issue with him putting out the judges' names and his commitment to Supreme Courts. That will go a lot farther than any four years he would be in the White House or eight years, heaven forbid, him to be in the White House. And his commitment to Supreme, um, the conservative justices that he had on his list, that was worth it for me. And I held my nose and went in and voted for him. Also for the reason, Brad, when, when you look at politics, it's about the policies and, you know, the bilateral choice between his policies and Hillary Clinton's, there's, there's no choice in, in that regard, you know, choosing between limited government and big government, uh, pro-life and, and pro-choice, uh, immigration policies and open borders, I, you know, not to get too political here, but when it got down to the, the actual choice between, you know, the Republican policies and the Democrat policies, it, it wasn't an option. Um, and 
I am not a never Trumper. I'm not a Trump Kool-Aid drinker. I'm, I feel like I'm a pretty rational, level-headed, pragmatic pol political person. And, you know, I, I think it, there's a, there's a room in the, on, at the table and in the conversation for people that support a person's uh, policies, but uh, don't condone uh, his actions. And, you know, even to the, you know, for the last four years, you know, starting with Access Hollywood and, and moving forward to, to all the litany of horrible things he's tweeted about people and the things he said about people, Republicans and Democrats. But, but I think where it was really turned for me was, you know, I was on CNN on election night and I, when he was questioning the integrity of the election, I had a big problem with that. I, I said it on the air. I said, our, our elections are free and fair and you know granted there might be some mishaps here and there but nothing to to change the outcome and when he questioned the integrity of the election refused to acknowledge that he lost and joe biden won um, refused to to have a peaceful transfer of power for weeks um, and then questioning um and and calling out people to try and stop the certification of, of the election results on electoral college votes that there was a bridge way too far okay. um, because the, the damage of of setting in people's mind that our elections are not fair and they're not uh, of integrity that's that's crap um i've been a deputy secretary of state in arkansas we ran elections and they're run state by state. There's too many checks and balances in our election process for there to be widespread voter fraud, which he was claiming, which is crap. So uh, that's that's when when I realized there's a much more okay. long-term damage to come out of this. And you know, still questioning the outcome of the election. That's where yeah. that's where I have a problem. With right. That. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I don't point punches. I despise them. I despise them as a human being. Um, I don't understand. Uh, and again, I'm going to refer to you because this, I, I consider you the SME, subject matter expert. This is your area. I'm a retired military guy. You see the flag behind me, up above it is my shadow box. Like I said, I did 20 years and 28 days in the military. When, try not to curse. When he went after Senator McCain, now I didn't agree with all of Senator McCain's policies, but I respected Senator McCain. I admired Senator McCain. He was a war hero. I worked on, in 1992, I worked on, a, uh, when I was in the Navy, I worked on a, a, a special assignment that was uh, from the Senate. I think it was John Kerry, uh, Senator Kerry, and I think it was Senator McCain, I can't remember who else, declassifying POW MIA documents. I saw his documents and what he endured. And also, if you remember, Ross Perot's VP was Admiral Stockdale, who was messed up, who was a prisoner of war. Right. When he attacked Senator McCain and said, I, like, I don't like my war heroes. My, I like my war heroes not captured. Being a Republican, being in that, that line of work, did you think at that moment his campaign is done? Because any other candidate, I feel, you mentioned Ted Cruz. We, we can go back to Gary Hart when he was on the boat with, I think, Jessica Hahn, the Democrat monkey business. It was a picture. We didn't have TMZ and all those things now. But that picture derailed him. He was done. He was right. done. Right, right. Now, you mentioned Hollywood Access. The McCain thing was actually before the Hollywood Access tape came on. Did you think back then, being in, in the field that you're in, that just that comment alone is going to derail them? Yes. Uh, I was working on the Cruz campaign. I'll never forget. I'd taken like five minutes off to, to relax with some friends. And I was relaxing with friends. And I saw that news flash up. It was on a weekend, I remember, and saw that. And I thought, He's done. It's over. It's done. That, that's, uh, that's abhorrent to say for anyone to say that about anyone uh, in the military. It, it's, it's over. And how he came back from that, I'll never understand. But, but like I said, for anyone to question a, someone's military service um, is abhorrent. But for a five-time draft dodger, Corporal Bonespur, to, to criticize a hero like John McCain, that's, that's, I, I just, it's the appalling. words, it's appalling. It appalling. It, it, it's it appalling. appalling. It's an insult. It's um, disgusting. And I, I just, I just felt like Senator McCain is a hero. And you know the whole story. He had the chance to, to, 
So his father was an admiral. His father he had the chance to get out. out, and he said, "No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hey. do it like everyone else. I'm gonna be with my with my team." And I mean, talk about courage. Uh, um, he's the picture of he courage and he hero. His, his arm I know. comb his own hair. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm I think sure. I think we're in agreement on that. One. Okay. I would be remiss. I'm not asking you to to attack uh, Ted Cruz. But I would be remiss if I didn't say this. Um, me personally, the Italian side of me, if you were to come after my better half and, and, and call her names and then make up BS that my father, who was everything to me, was part of the assassination of Kennedy, even though they like to twist and spin it, the National Enquirer and all, well, he just put it out there. He didn't actually see, that's a little game that they play. He, and he's right. got that game down. Well, he didn't say it directly. People are saying, I heard, that's, you know exactly what that is, and I do too. I, I don't want to insult your intelligence. Like, it, 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 it's, you're attempting to insult mine, not you, but when they do that. He talked about his wife. He talk, there's politics, and politics are dirty from the Democrats and Republicans, and it's a dirty game. And if you got dirt in your background, it's going to come out. We know that. Okay. I don't always like it, but that's part of the beast. If you go into it, and you got something in your closet, it's most likely going to come out. But what I don't understand what, what Cruz is this. You just said something, and we're in agreement so far. Stop the steal. It was fraud, all of that. How does, and Ted Cruz is not, I, I never will say that he's a dumb person. He's a, he's a successful he's lawyer. He's brilliant. not a stupid person. He's not a stupid person. But, he, but my opinion, you do stupid things when you're a sitting senator from any state, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, and you perpetuate a lie, which Ted Cruz is guilty of doing, about this election was right. He stood up there, him and Holly and all these guys. And none of these guys are stupid people. They, they, they're not born. We, we don't know that they're born with their, half of their brain doesn't work or they have a deformity or, you know, they're bipolar or whatever. You know, well, it's questionable. But seriously, how do you, the man that you worked with then, is that the man that you see now with this stop the steal and stuff that he's doing? Look, I, I've been very clear that the stop the steal is um, unfounded. There's not enough votes to overturn the election. And I, I've been quite clear about that. But, but what we're seeing with uh, many of the Republican senators and those in the House, I talk to a lot of them all the time, Brad, and, and they look at the their initial request was to look at voting irregularities. And in some areas there are, of you know, a hundred here, a thousand there, but yes. no, nowhere near enough to overturn the election. But but they wanted to make sure and take a look at that. Okay, that's fine. But but don't question the integrity of the election. But what what they did, and, and you know this, the, the ultimate um, caveat for them not voting to, uh, whether impeach the president or to vote to convict, was more of a constitutional issue. And it was the constitutional issue, the way that uh, attorneys, uh, like all of those that, that we've mentioned, they looked at the constitutional aspect that um, if someone had committed an offense um, while in office, if they're no longer in office, it's not constitutionally um, viable to convict them uh, of impeachment if they are no longer in office. I disagree. There's a super smart uh, Republican attorney, Chuck Cooper, who was actually Ted Cruz's attorney on the campaign. He sees the constitutional argument differently. He sees that you should be judged based on the merits of your misconduct. And you ask me the, the merits of uh, the president's misconduct, inciting, inviting, and instigating this insurrection was more than warranted for an impeachment. And I don't care if he was not in office, he should have been impeached and he should uh, no longer be allowed to run for office. But that is, it's not a, a sucking up to Trump. It is not a never Trumper. It is nothing more than all of the members of Congress I've talked to, um, Congress and, and the, in the Senate, they look at that constitutional argument as to why they voted the way they did. Okay. Out of curiosity, since we're talking about Ted Cruz as, as, as a citizen of America, ridiculous what he did getting on that plane? Yes. And he'll acknowledge that as well. Uh, you know, I, um, was shocked when I, I heard it um, because um, he 
really does enjoy the, not enjoy, but he really is uh, accountable to his constituents. He likes talking to them. He likes engaging with them. After Hurricane Harvey, um, he spent a lot of time down there um, in the sweltering sun, um, helping distribute water and sandbags. He um, has a big heart for that kind of constituent outreach. So um, I was shocked that he did that. I I'm glad that he got back as soon as he did and acknowledged that it was a huge mistake. And I, I think there's a, a lot that uh, needs to be done for him to, to try and um, make good with uh, his constituents, and he is fully aware of that. But uh, I, you know, he's a, a he's a good person, a great person with a great heart that made a great mistake, and he's tr he's making good on it. We'll disagree. We'll agree to disagree on that point. Uh, you know him better than me. The one thing that I, that I think I think he's arrogant. I think that he got caught, and and it could have been a Democrat too, because I mean, we've seen it. We've seen politicians get caught. I think personally he got caught. He didn't think he was going to get caught because he had planned to go down there sooner. But the, the final thing on- Oh, on, and I, on, on that point, I, I I agree that he should not have gone down there. Right, I, no, know, no, wasn't no, like no. He I didn't mean, think he wasn't gonna get caught. People would know, but I he clearly did not recognize the backlash of it at the time uh, until he, as he said, when he sat on the plane, he realized this is not good because he got backlash, but right, you know. Right, but, but in all honesty, and, and you're, you're a smart woman, I respect you. If it would have been me, I would have had more respect for this. You don't leave because you, you're a senator. I'm a public citizen. So if I get on a plane, it's a little different. Right. You're a senator. You're a sitting senator from the state of Texas. If you're concerned about your girls and you're losing power in your house, I wouldn't have a problem if he sent his mother-in-law or his, 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 his parents on a plane and they took the kids. I'd have no problem with that. None. But you even, I, there was just a story today, a representative, Republican representative called him out and I can't think of who it is from right. Texas, but okay. Um, yeah, well, and I would have been happy to go down to Cabo and spend the week with the girls. Right, but not, but not, but not when people are suffering and you're no, constituents. No, I know, I'm so, I was, that was yeah. making light of it, but no, yeah, he, right. I, and I think he realizes that now, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked that it didn't occur to him prior to stepping okay. on the plane. All right, yeah. another uh, question I want to ask you, and this is from my military side, and I, I know that you would probably obviously talking to that you were disgusted, but this was a bridge too far for me, uh, even way back when. When Trump stood in Helsinki next to Putin, I have never seen, a, I worked for four commander in chiefs, three of them were Republicans, that's uh, President Reagan, Papa Bush, President Bush, uh, President Clinton, and the son, President Bush. I have never heard a sitting president from either party ever say, and I, I feel suck up and never call him out, even though he tries to say, well, I'm tougher on Russia. Okay, whatever. Give Putin a break. But standing up as an American president, I was outraged in Helsinki in 17, across from Putin saying, well, I asked him about did he, he tamper with the election and he told me that I don't have any reason not to believe him. And I don't care how they spin it, he said it because they always walk back. Don't get me wrong, Democrat, Republican, all of them have moments and they got to try to walk it back. But Trump had more moments than anyone I've ever seen in the right. White House. Even when they said, God bless President Reagan, even when they claimed that he was, he had Alzheimer's, which I don't know if he had it then or not, when they tried to talk about the Iran Contra and all that, that he was, his mental uh, capacity was slipping. Whether it was or wasn't, I don't know. But you've never seen a sitting president say that sitting with Putin and, and who was it? Uh, his, was it DNI? or uh, Dan Coates at the time was like, he couldn't believe it. As, a, as an American, I'm not even asking you as a party affiliation, as American, how did you feel? Uh, betrayed. Um, I mean, Putin is one of our greatest allies. Of course, China's right on up there, but f uh, it was almost as though he, cl he clearly sided you know, with Putin. And it, it would be one thing if it was, um, dialogue and diplomacy uh, between he and Putin from a diplomatic standpoint. And he came back here and, and raised Cain and uh, was more of a leader, but that didn't happen. And, and to be, uh, I've said this before, a lapdog for Putin was uh, disappointing, um, you know, but that's the way he operated. Uh, I think he it was one 
saving grace. He was strong on China, which is, uh, I guess, our consolation prize. But, you know, each president has a different way of, of engaging in diplomatic dialogue. Um, not to, I'm not a fan of what aboutism. I, I don't like to do that. But I was also just as frustrated with Obama when he's whispering to world leaders, hey, I'll have more flexibility when I'm reelected. So, you know, there's bits and pieces of, of con you know, conversations that are, are overheard or, or, or discussed. But yes, uh, overall, um, that was a, a problem. But from a bigger standpoint, I, I was supportive for the most part of the president's foreign policy with regard to, you know, America first and flexing our muscles and um, getting out of NATO. So I, I looked at his comprehensive uh, foreign policy position uh, and not just the, his, uh, I felt a weakness with Putin. Okay. Um you had mentioned China. You, you're well, uh, you're much more well versed on policy stuff than that. I'm actually not a political person. I became more politically outspoken because of my uh, disgust with, with Trump. But conceding, uh, because I don't, I, I'm one of those type of people, if I don't know enough about a topic, I'm not going to just pull it out of the air. But the problem with China, um, not debating you on the policy part, but again, going back to what you don't like is that we agreed on early on is tone of demeanor. Wuhan flu, China flu. That wasn't necessary. I mean, no, he did that to, he did that to, to stir up the base and right. piss people off. And it did come on. That's not even, that's not even remotely presidential. And I must, like I said, I'm not, I'm not here to condone every single president because they all say dumb things at one time or another, but he purposely went out of his way, Alice, to do these type of things, to spin up the base, and and for whatever reason, how did how did that help? Well, it didn't, and you know his his uh, mindset of pouring salt on an open wound was is one that he felt was one of his assets, and that's what made him, you know, a, a strong business leader, um, and that's what, as you said, it, it's red meat for the the base is what it was. You know, with regard to China, not to get too much into it, but, you know, he, he, he would always talk about China when he was running for office. It was China, China, China. And, uh, you know, he talked about um, theft of intellectual property, currency manipulation, the debt trap diplomacy. And, and these are, you know, big issues. And until I had the opportunity in 2019 to go to Africa on a, a, a work trip and see how China goes to these um low income impoverished nations and says, hey, we'll build you an airport. And when they default on their loan, then China has a new airport or hey, we'll build you this port. And when they can't pay off the loans, China owns this new port. So China's ability to look long term and negotiate and, and seize property and valuable property, um, it's an issue. And, and I think the president and Mike Pence was instrumental in going out and trying to to get ahead and, and call attention to the um, Belt and Road Initiative that China is engaging in across the world. And that's a, a really in-depth way of looking at there are issues that of China that has been harmful to the nation or the world. And I think the Trump administration was wise to call them out on it and raise attention to it. But as you said, the way he treated um, Look, I, I thought we should have pulled out of NATO, but for him going there and, and, and acting as he did when they had NATO meetings was, um, I didn't feel helpful to, to the situation. But, but as you said, his base, I go back to Arkansas a lot. I go back to Georgia. I go to travel around for work. The people in middle America, the, the farmers, the blue collar workers, they love the fact, not that he's just a jerk to people, but they like the fact that he stands up to people, that he speaks his mind, that he's not afraid of saying something that's going to piss someone off. Um, they like that aspect of that. They like the fact that he fights for them and they look at him as the voice that they have not had. Um, and that's why I, I see that he continues to have small influence with with people across the country and support within the Republican Party. But I feel like for me, we've done that experiment. Um, it was uh, successful uh, on certain issues, but we lost the House, we lost the Senate, and we lost the White House based in large part on that tone and tenor and the fact that he was so uh, egregious and aggressive to people. We need to 
put that in the rearview mirror and find someone that supports the policies, but does so in a way that is more Reagan-like or certainly more uh, respectable. And that's the way to the future because, you know, what he did in terms of policy was, was what the red meat, what the base wants, but the tone and tenor is what lost our, our hold in Washington and, and people okay. need to realize that. One other thing I want to talk about, because it means a lot to me, and I'm, I got a feeling I know we, that we're probably going to be in agreement here. And folks, you see that? We're, we're a different, uh, I'm an, in, for the record, I'm an independent. I was a Democrat. Right. I was a Republican till, till they put up Trump for the presidency. And I said, I'm done. I can't do it. I, I didn't. I voted for Hillary. Wasn't a fan of Hillary to a certain extent, but I wasn't going to vote for Trump. So I left the party. I became independent. If I saw a Republican candidate that I thought it would probably more, be more on a state level, but actually, I, I me personally, you you were with with Cruz. I liked John Kasich, and I'm I'm pro and I'm pro choice. He's pro life. But no candidate, at least I feel, no candidate is going to check every box for you. I don't I don't right. believe that. None right. of them are. So you have to figure out what are you willing to live with, what are you not willing to live with, and then see how they govern from there because. They may be, as you know, well better, uh, much more than I do. They may change a little bit because that's the nature of, of the game. But one more point I want to talk about because it, it really is a bone of contention with me is Charlottesville. My better half is African-American. I have a son that's mixed. My mm -hmm. dad's side was Jewish. My mother's side is Italian, which I always tell people. That means I like expensive things, the Italian, at a discount for the Jewish side. So I, I, <laughs> I cover both sides. He stood up. You had Heather Heyer die, ran in the thing. He stood up there and he said, there were fine people on both sides. I would be okay with that, but the side that he was saying it was fine people were with tiki torches, calling black people the N-word, calling Jewish people the K-word, and screaming out blood and soil. You're a small woman, you know what blood and soil means. For my viewers, it's about Nazism. You don't know. Here's the hypocritical part about that for me. Besides for I thought it was appalling. Right. His daughter converted to Judaism when she married Jared, who I think is an Orthodox Jew, but if not, he's Jewish at a minimum. Right. Her right. kids are Jewish. Right. That means that Donald Trump's grandkids are Jewish. So how are there fine people in a group that are screaming out, Jews are the K-word, blood and soil, Jews will not replace us. How do you even come out of your mouth with that statement? And even worse, you had Elaine Choi, who's behind you, who's an Asian American. You had Gary Cohen, I think, who resigned shortly thereafter, who is Jewish. Who what was, this was a big factor. <laughs> right, it was a big factor. I mean, right then, I know it's not an impeachable offense, but right then, people should have said, you know, but it shouldn't be that shocking because if you go back to the days of when his father and him were renting, Apartments. This is all fact. This isn't me right. making it up or pulling out the air because I'm a, a, a because I'm more liberal on social issues and I'm more conservative on fiscal issues with the yeah. with spending the money. That's we're the I same. Kinda, we're we're well, similar in that regard. Yeah. That's where I got south with the, the Democratic Party because you can't give everything away for free. Period. Right. But he showed you who he was. You had women voters. You brought up something. Hollywood access tape. I've said this on my show many times. I'm a man. I have talked locker room talk. I'm not saying that's right. I've heard women do it. I said, I heard men do it. I'm not trying to minimize. I'll say I've done it. I've said something about a woman or she's good looking or this or that. I've said it. But there's a difference. And see, that was a little play that they try to do. There's a difference between Brad Berkwood saying locker room talk and saying, because of who I am, I can move on her like a bee. Because he looked to me, he looked at it like he was Donald Trump, he was the apprentice guy, he was the real estate mogul, and all of this stuff, which I, I got to go back to something he said before we segue out um, about the business. But I felt that he felt, and I think a lot of Republicans felt it too, because they were disgusted with it. You had Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham, I don't even know who Lindsey Graham is anymore. I think he's a robot today. I don't, right. I don't care about his policies. But the person that I see, this man, and I know you know the clip I'm talking about, it might have been on CNN. Donald Trump is xenophobic, he's homophobic, he's a race baiter, and he's going to get our troops in trouble with this stuff that he's talking about during the election. Now Lindsey Graham is on the Trump train, 
drinking the Kool-Aid. When remember this line? Count me out. And then what do you do that weekend? He gets on the plane, he goes to the Alamo. And he's still talking about stop the steal. I, you know, it's just, it's I, I my my thing, the, the Charlottesville point that I was saying is. I know as an American, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I know as an American, I look at your timeline. I see that you're friendly. And, and this is, I don't believe in this, oh, because I'm friendly with a black person, that makes me whatever. But I see that you're friendly with um, Abby, what's her name, what's her last name? Abby Phillips. Yeah, you share a lot yeah. of her tweets and all that. You guys are on the, I think, at least publicly, are on two different sides of, of the political issues, maybe, at least when I, when I see her talk. My point is, as an American, with what he said and what he did, I, I would assume that that was appalling to you as well? well unequivocally, it was appalling and, and disgusting and disturbing. And um, how he could not have come right out and apologized profusely and done something to bring the country together on all of those fronts um, is astounding to me. And, and you made an important point, and this wasn't just about you know, African Americans and, um, you know, Caucasian Americans. This, there were so many subsects in the insult, as you say, the Jewish people, you know, African Americans. And so it was just so blanketly um, inappropriate and uh, appalling um, for him to not be able to come out and say something is, I, I just never understood that. But it, it goes back to a lot of why he does what he does and says what he said and how he tried to clean it up but made it worse is you know these groups support him and like him like these um stupid people that stormed the capitol um the proud boys and the, those um horrible organizations they have expressed support for this president or the former president and for some reason he feels like well if they like me i gotta throw him a bone every now and then or i gotta gotta you know say something not so disparaging about them. And I think that's a, it's a bad character trait. <laughs> it's a bad trait. Right, right. And, and it sets a really bad example because, you know, when, when there's despicable activity going on, like what was going on in, in Charlottesville, there should be just as equal condemnation for that. And, uh, you know, I worry, you know, how do, how do you explain to your kids, like, you know, this isn't how you treat people. And, you know, furthermore, when you treat people like that, there are consequences. And I will say this, um, there's some comfort in knowing that there were consequences for Trump's behavior because he's no longer the president. And uh, I feel like that should be a reminder to, to people that you need to be a little more kind to people. Because I know I, I spent a week in Georgia campaigning in January for this uh, special, the special election, the Senate race, and a lot of Republicans didn't come out to vote specifically because of the tone and tenor of Trump. And okay. that's a consequence. Okay. But the bad thing is it's not just for him, it's for Republicans who wanted policy. So uh, th anyway, that's a, kind of a soapbox of mine, right. but- No, no, um, that's fine. So let me ask you this, and you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but I would be remiss and I know my viewers would say, how come you didn't ask this? Did you vote for him in 2020? I did. I, I did because I'm a Republican and I, you know, I've said this on, on the air before, but um, I wouldn't vote for him again. You know, if he ran again, I wouldn't because of everything that's happened since this election. Um, but again, the contrast, I, I'm, I'm going to vote. I'm an American citizen. Voting is an important right that people <laughs> fought and died for. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to vote. Um, but when it came down to the binary choice between his policies and Joe Biden's, it, there is, uh, there's not a you know, second thought for me. I, I think Joe Biden is a, a man of tremendous integrity and empathy and grace and compassion. Um, but right out of the gate, the first day of his executive action uh, rollout, you know, it gave me heartburn for, you know, a lot of the policies, you know, that he um, ha has implemented, you know, in terms of foreign policy with the, uh, with regard to the, the life issue, with um, what he's done with the energy policy. So, you know, it, it, it feels good um, to see someone with such um, character and grace and dignity, but uh, the, the political burn is, is kind of a bad aftertaste. Okay. I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm not here, not here to put you down. I mean, 
you know how Twitter is. I see people come after you for your views. You know that they come after me for mine. That's okay. I mean, some of the things are stupid that they say, but regardless, um, I couldn't, I could, if, even if I was Republican, me personally, I could, even if I was, and I understand the policies, but the, the person, I, I couldn't take four more years. If I, if I was a Trump supporter the first time around, I, I couldn't take four more years of his, the, the, the tweet. And I, and I think, honestly, the best thing, besides where he lost for me, I think the thing that hurt him the most, because he's such a child, and to me, he acts like such a, a spoiled brat child, was him getting pulled off of Twitter. That messed right. him up, which is ridiculous because that should have been the least of it. I mean, he's, but he abused people. Okay. I don't want to beat a dead horse. And I actually was going to ask you something, but you clarified it. You were, I absolutely agree with you in any election, no matter who the president, whether it was President Bush one or President Clinton, President Obama, whoever, you're always going to have pockets of, of issues with, with voting, whether it's a machine, whether it's, I'm not saying, but there, you, we both agree there was no widespread where right. he could overturn it. Because in that, um, you, you did an in, that interview with, hold on, let me find it here. Um, it was with, uh, who was it with? It was with um, HPR, is that Harvard? Harvard Public what, Harvard Political yeah. Review, now, yes. I, I'm actually gonna ask you this, but I already know that you said that you weren't for it, but this is misleading. I don't know if they misquoted you, but you had said, uh, absolutely, there are a lot of people in the Republican Party, the Never Trumpers, the Lincoln Project people who will vote for Joe Biden, though they still are, they're, they are still Republicans. If Trump loses, the GOP might reevaluate its, its strategies and see what should be done moving forward. The GOP learned from mistakes in the 2012 election and focused on making those changes in 2016. Now, this is where I got confused. I was going to ask you, but then you said that you were not for all the stop the steal and you call them on it. But this is the part that I was confused. In that same quote, it said, if Trump were to not win, the GOP would have to do some serious searching for what went wrong and how to get back on track. But I think that that interview was after the election, right? I I don't think so. I believe okay. that interview was done with one of my students. Okay. Um, but it was before it was before the election. Okay, okay. That's um, I, I had a feeling because I, I right. think the date was more current, but I could be wrong on that. But you answered the question because I was I was going to ask yeah. you where did you stand on it, but you already said you weren't for any of that stop still. Okay. Let's move to talking about what you've already expressed some feelings. You you blame him for the insurrection, for spinning them people up and, and With, having them? Without a doubt. I mean, th those people didn't just happen to, to be in D.C. on vacation. I mean, he the, the president specifically, A, it started before the election, him raising questions about, you know, the votes, an election night, him not... Uh, conceding. Granted, it hadn't been officially called November on November 7th. 3rd. It was, it was a few days after, November but 7th. not conceding at that time and continuing to say that the election was not valid and there was um, voter fraud um, and, and in inviting people to D.C. on January 6th, the day that the certification of the electoral votes was happening. He invited them there. He went down there at the the rally on the mall and said, let's fight, fight, fight. And his uh, lawyer, Rudy Giuliani said, um, let's go um, trial by combat. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that is insightful language. Yes. And the president saying, go down to the Capitol. And, and I'll march with you. Remember that? I, which, well, that, yeah. Cool, I'll, cool, and cool. I'll be, I'll be with you, which yeah. it amazed me. None of those people, none of those crazy people, Okay, and not and, and I'm I'm trying to be fair. I try to be fair. I'm, I'm going to make a point because I want my viewers to, to hear this. But nobody turned to somebody and said, "Hold up, you know what up? Where's Trump? Trump got in his SUV, went back and watched it on TV." There, I'm sure there were people down there that, um, I, not, I'm not sure. I know that for a fact. But you had people that didn't go into the Capitol that went down there to to your. Whether whatever protest it is, to scream at the building, you know, whatever. But they didn't go in the Capitol and, and break in. Nobody said when he was going down there, he never went down there and opened the door and said, come on in, guys. Come on in. He went back to a tent and stood there with Jared and the daughter and watched it on TV while Don Jr. Well, let me start on Don Jr. 
walking around with a camera. You know, th right. that's another thing, Alice. You, you've never seen, uh, uh, for the most part, I know what social media pushes it out in our faces. His kids perpetuate this stuff where they would not have a voice if it wasn't for their dad. You just had Don Jr., okay, who looks like he's, I'm going to say it, coked out of his mind. He looks like he's insane. With a video about the teachers' union, you can have your views, fine. I don't have to agree with them. You don't have to agree with mine. I don't have to agree with yours. That's America. But he's sitting there with the guns behind him. I mean, really, is that the message you're trying to send? Because Lauren Boebert does it with the guns and, and Marjorie Taylor Greene. That's the last question I want to ask you about that, about the party. I want to come off of Trump. Oh, and I also want to give you credit. You did call out Mitch McConnell. You got a little dig on him. You said, maybe if you would have voted to uh, the other way because he played it he played it both ways don't get me wrong brilliant politician not a fan of his but boy he played it two ways he kicked it down the road and said no let's do it after president biden's in and then he said we we can't convict the sitting president now whatever i thought that was that was a political move i would assume and correct me if i'm wrong that doing my research on you and talking to you today. And again, I have a, a lot of respect for you. If my viewers don't like that, that's fine. You can hate me for it. I could talk to someone that I can have a conversation with. I can't talk to someone that's programmed that's going to tell me that uh, um, Trump is going to uh, come in there and get rid of all the pedophiles and that Tom Hanks is eating kids. I can't talk to people like that. And I, I just, I can't, I can't do it. Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, Lauren, Lauren Bobart and Matt Gates in particular. Problem I have with the insanity and the QAnon, and she said all of this stuff. It's not like I'm making it up. Right. Whether you whether you like the, the young man's beliefs from Parkland or not, you don't do you don't chase them down the street. And no. I wouldn't agree with that if Democrats did it either. I don't. That's that's wrong. You can have a difference in, in philosophical uh, in philosophical difference. You can have a difference politically, but you don't chase a kid underage down the street like when they when they attack Greta Thunberg or I would say she's a kid right I'll say something about Trump's adult kids because they're adults and they put themselves in the mix and he put them in the White House but I will never talk about Barron because he's underage it's off limits I won't do it and I won't let people on my side do it but the Republican Party do they want and, and let me Matt Gates Matt Gates who went to Wyoming with that crap attacking Liz Cheney because she voted her conscience the Republican Party censuring people because they voted their conscience. But you didn't even censure Donald Trump at a minimum. You didn't even censure him. He, he, he got away with doing the insurrection, period. Now, in the public um, view, I think that's where he's, he's fried. I think if he tries to run in 2024, he don't got a chance. Right. Now, whether he gets a nomination or not, we'll see. But does your party want to be the party of green? and Bulbert and people like Mo Brooks, who was part of that insurrection, screaming that stuff, or do they want to be more like somebody you mentioned, President Reagan? Look, I didn't agree with every president that was in the White House, and I, like I said, I served under four, but I always respected it. I lost, me personally, I lost respect when he went in for many reasons, but what does your party want to be today? Do they want to be the party of the QAnon craziness, or do they want to get back to what they really stood for before this craziness with the stop to steal and all of this? Uh, let me just, a, a couple couple things. Um, the party wants to be what it has always been, the party of limited government, fiscal responsibility, law and order, um, life, religious liberty, um, and people being accountable for their own actions. But uh, in a respectful civil way and I said as a, a Reagan way um, you just look at what you're talking about the QAnon the crazies the insurrectionists uh, the QAnon is a not a emblematic or representative of the Republican Party there are people that s some of them might have supported Trump and have Republican policies but that is not emblematic and representative of the Republican Party and to the question of is that the future? You just have to go look at the most recent case study that we've had on this very issue with regard to, you know, Trump loving, um, super diehard in the wool Republicans 
in a red state like my home state of Georgia, the Senate re-election um, or the Senate election with David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler, they couldn't have been more Trump-like and they lost. So the Republican Party is fully aware that Trump does have a strong following and a strong base and a strong contingency of people. But um, you can only lose so many times before you realize you have to use a new playbook. And as I said, losing the House and the Senate and the White House and this key Senate, these two key Senate races, um, the GOP understands that there needs to be a, a new direction and a new voice. And the president will have a, a strong influence uh, on the party moving forward. And if he wants to do his childish little revenge politics in the midterm elections. You, you and you talked about and, that. You talked about that. You didn't yeah. like that. You don't like yeah. that he's doing that. No, the revenge politics is is not only childish, it's it's not going to work. We're not going to win back the house by him going around and, and playing uh, I gotcha with uh, people that have said things and spoken out against them. It's not going to work. And the goal, priority number one for um, Republicans needs to be, how are we going to win back the House in, in 2022 and, and maybe even the Senate? And that needs to be the goal. And I do not believe that the policies and the demeanor of the, the former president are the way to go about doing it because we lost doing that and we're not going to move forward doing that. And okay. and I think, let me just ask you this quick question, Brad. You're a former boxer. Um, if you kept losing your bouts, wouldn't your trainer say, we need to do something different? Yeah, <coughs> yeah, so absolutely. I think that's what the Republican party is gonna do. But I would be remiss if I didn't say this. I think that that's a smart thing to do. I think that's common sense. I don't think that's, that's not <coughs> uh, something me. that makes us Albert Einstein. That would what is it? I forget the saying, the definition of insanity is, what is it? The same thing over yeah. and over and expecting but, a different results. There you go. Yet, yet, you got Kevin McCarthy going down there and kissing his butt. I mean, really? If you want to move forward, you know better than me that Mitch McConnell, whether, whether, whether people like him or not, you know he can't stand Trump. I know he, I know, I feel that he used him as a useful idiot. We're getting, I know that, the, the justices you got in, I understand that. You got the tax thing in. I think McConnell was way more, is, not what it was, is way more shrewd of a politician and smarter than Trump ever was and will ever be. But you got um, McConnell who still plays this, this political game where he, he talks about him, but then he kind of, he kind of goes with so I'm trying, I, I don't understand how, to, to me, like you just said, you lost all of these things. You would think now would be the time. I know he's got all of these votes. He's got a strong base, but you would think you'd want to distance yourself. And I'm not saying that you don't have some people in your party that do, because obviously when you had, I think 10 house Republicans and even Bill Cassidy from Louisiana, which is a very red state voted to, you know, convict, uh, uh, Trump. You have some people, and of course they got punished. Let me ask you just one other thing, because we talked about it. Do you think it was right for the GOP parties to censure them because they voted to convict? No, no, they were voting their conscience, and that's exactly what Mitch McConnell told them to do. Vote your conscience. He didn't, he didn't, um, excuse me, he didn't whip them. He didn't say we should all get together and vote a certain way. Vote their conscience, and they did. Okay. All right, let's come off of politics and get back to more some some fun stuff again. <coughs> Excuse me. So you have an interesting thing going on. You like running, and I think you're training for a marathon. Well, I trained for marathons in the past. Okay. I, okay. Right now, I'm I'm you know a, just a very active runner and um, work out quite a bit. But year a few years ago, I was a marathon trainer. I trained people for marathons for for charities and for different reasons. Um, and we got to travel the world doing different marathons. So it was a lot of fun. I've, I've done the Boston Marathon five times, um, but I, I, I enjoy it. It's, it's fun. It's a great way to meet people and travel and uh, sort of stay relatively sane. <laughs> okay. And people, you don't know this, but Alice and I were talking email, kidding around. And I said that I got a quote from her, her fifth grade teacher that she chewed bubble yum. And Alice said, no, it would be, I forget what you said, but it would be bubble, oh, bubble yum on the softball field, big red in the classroom. 
So That's right. when you said that, I, I did just out of curiosity, did you play softball when you were younger? I did. I was, I, I, I was, I, I was one of the larger girls. <laughs> Let me okay. say that I was the shot put and the disc champion. Okay. Um, so I was the, the softball player that would, you know, hit the ball. I, I was a pretty good, but I, Threw left-handed and bat, batted right-handed. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah, yeah, we love we love softball. But okay. we'd always have the you chew gum that came in that thing that looked like dip. The big, oh, the little thing or the big league one? It came in the pouch. Yeah, the big, big league, league gum. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. We're showing our ages, folks, and we're only in our 20s. Okay. <laughs> it looks like in about 2019, you became a Harvard fellow at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. Talk about that. Oh, that's awesome. It was great. Um, I... Um, at the time, I lived in residence, uh, had a great place on, on campus, and I taught a study group um, for the students on basically what we're doing here on civility in American politics and how you can have civil conversations with people on the issues um, and agree to disagree. And I, I taught, you know, I encouraged the students to um, agree, you know, show compassion, show ability to compromise, um, show uh, ability to have conversations and, and be civil. And, uh, you know, it's not a secret that um, Harvard is not a bastion for conservatism, but it was a great group. I had, um, in my class, I was able to have, you know, guests come to, to sh demonstrate the having bipartisan conversations. I had one week, Jim Acosta came up to my class and spoke. Um, another week, Kellyanne Conway zoomed in from the White House. I had someone from the RNC, uh, the DNC. I had this past um, fall, I was a fellow again, and everything was virtual. I had Donna Brazil one week. I had Steve Cortez from the Trump campaign. I had the people from the circus, Mark McKinnon. So uh, I tried to demonstrate to the students that um, it's really important in this toxic environment to, to um, have these conversations and especially in a in a university setting that is a um su supposed to encourage um independent thinking uh don't get caught up in the silos of ideology and really challenge um challenge the diversity of of ideology you know and and i think the younger generation is so awesome with um embracing diversity of of, of gender and race and you know ethnic group and religion and I, I encourage them to, to also be a little more open-minded on diversity of ideology. And the students have been really awesome. Okay. One more question that just popped in my head um, talking to you. What would they be surprised? You're, you're a Republican, as you said, still. What would people be surprised and what would you be willing to share that someone may not know that goes against being a Republican and it's more because of who you are as a human being? Uh, probably my, um, the, um, marriage issue, um, you know, the rights, you know, same sex marriage. I, I have so many dear friends that are gay and married and they have probably stronger marriages than, um, you know, heterosexual couples. Right. And, um, I, I, I I think they should have the same rights and um, ability to to be married as as you know people that are are in heterosexual marriages. I, I've I've been married before, and I can say that gay people should be miserably married just like the rest of us <laughs> at some point. Uh, but no, I, I, that's one issue that's probably not mainstream Republican. But uh, that's no, me personal. Me not. personal. My, my personal thought um, is a little different. Okay, I, I respect you for that. All right, let's segue into the second part of the interview. These are all fun, random questions. There's no right or wrong answers. Uh, if you don't have an answer for one, you can email me and say, hey, Brad, I meant to say this. <laughs> all right, so let's start out with, what is your favorite genre of movies? Um, chick flicks, like anything Nicholas Sparks, um, chick flicks. <laughs> okay, okay. Do you have a, a go-to favorite movie? Uh, probably like Knights and Rodanth or okay. Dear John. Okay. Uh, but that's it. when I'm in that genre. Um, I mean, I, I like, you know, different things. I'm trying to think. Actually, actually, what I really love is like, um, like 
the Jackie Robinson movie about, about baseball. And I love movies. I love um, athletic movies like um, Prefontaine, the guy that used to be the quarterback for the Eagles. Yep. Those kind of things uh, about sports and overcoming adversity and field of dreams, those kind of things. I like that. Good, good flicks. Okay. Do you have a favorite actor? Uh, I like um, probably like Richard Gere. Okay. Like him. American, yeah. American Gigolo Richard Gere or Pretty Woman Richard Gere? Pretty Woman Richard Gere. <laughs> okay. Okay. Do you have a favorite actress? I like um, like uh, uh, Sandra Bullock. I like funny. I like funny stuff. Sandra okay. Bullock is is good. Yeah. Okay. And Jennifer Anderson. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a favorite musical band? Uh, well, currently I, I love to listen to, to Christian music, so I like you know, like Casting Crowns, um, that kind of thing. But my favorite singer is got to be Darius Rucker. Slash okay. Hootie and the Blowfish. Yeah, Hootie and Blowfish. I, I've, I've gone to see them more than anybody I've ever. Gone okay, to see. so that answered my next question. Was favorite male singer? Okay, do you have a favorite concert over the years that you went to that stands out? Darius Rucker and Lady Annabellum. Okay. Just because I just love them. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, I like them too. Actually, I just saw him perform. Not perform as Oak Cliff. I think he was at the Grand Ole Opry or somewhere. He he was perform. No, he did it. He did it. Um, there was a tribute to Charlie Pride. And oh great! Rucker did it. It's on. It's on YouTube. Yeah. Do you have a favorite female singer? And this could be from any any era, any genre. Uh, like um, Martina McBride. Okay, yeah. I'm feeling a country music flavor here. Yeah. Come on, you didn't go back and say Hank Williams. Well, I love Hank Williams. No, Patsy <laughs> Klein, Willie Nelson. Okay. Are you a out of curiosity? Are you a car person? Do you like muscle cars? Sports cars or not into it? No, I'm not that into it. Okay, you're an Uber? <laughs> you're an Uber person? No, I have a car. I love my car. It's an SUV. But <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Do you have a favorite noise or sound? Uh, my puppy. I okay. like hearing my puppy. <laughs> okay. Flip it. Least favorite noise or sound? Um, uh, nails on a chalkboard, of course, is one. And then this, I love to cook and I hate the sound of like a knife scraping on metal. I like wooden cutting boards. Yep. I know that sounds I'm silly, but. No, yeah. no, no. I'm with you there. I'm with you. <laughs> and every, a lot of people say nails on a chalkboard. And I don't know how well, you, if you remember, I mean, of course you remember the movie Jaws, but I don't know if you remember yeah. the scene when he was in the courthouse and they were going to hire him to kill the shark and he had the nails on a chalkboard drawn yeah. on Jaws. So I hate that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You just talked about cooking. So what is your favorite food? Um, cacha pepe with truffles. Okay. Okay. That sounds delicious. <laughs> if, um, if you would hit the lottery tomorrow for the two, three, $400 million lottery, what would be the first thing you would do? I would, uh, divide up a good portion of it for my nieces and nephews. Um, and then of course, give some to my church and then pay off my house and give some to my siblings. Okay. Um, but you know, the charity thing, I would, I would probably first, you know, give it, I've got a church in Little Rock and one here, I would divvy it up that way. Okay. Favorite pre COVID vacation destination? Uh, Umbria, Italy. Okay. Right outside of Rome. Okay. I was, I was stationed in uh, Sigonello, Sicily for the, okay. uh, in the boot during the Gulf War. Yeah. Okay. If you didn't go into the profession that she did, what do you think you would have done? Would have been a lawyer, probably. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If you could meet one person from any time in history, they could be dead or alive, any walk of life, who would you like to meet? And what would your first question be for them? Hank Aaron. Um, and how did you continue to stay focused in the midst of all the um, civil rights um, angst going on at the time. Okay. With everything we've discussed so far, Alice, if you had to sum yourself up in a few thoughts as a human being, what would you say? Um, driven, um, Christian, um, family loving, flawed, and grateful. Okay. 
You've done many, many interviews. You, of course, you do things on CNN. I know that's political, but you've done other interviews. Over all the years that you've done interviews, is there one question that either I or other people have not asked you? And if you have never been asked that question, what is it and what's your answer to it? Wow, that's a good one. Um, I don't know, I have to, have to think about that. Think about it for a second, give it a second. I have to think. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things like, I don't know, it, I, I don't know, I'd have to think. Okay, all right, email me the answer to that one. I can't edit it in, but I'm curious what your answer is. Okay, <coughs> I always Excuse end on this, the same question. Do you have a saying you live your life by? And if you do, what is it? No one can make you feel inferior about yourself except yourself by uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Okay. And that's, that's just something that I, um, I, I feel like so, so many, you know, and especially in what, what we do, you know, there's so many people are trying to make you feel bad or dumb or stupid or whatever, but, yeah, it only gets to you if you let it get to you. Okay. Um, as well, for my viewers, give them your social media platforms where they can find you. If you, have, I know you have a website, so put that out. Anything else social media wise you want to put out? Go for it. Uh, no, so, social media obviously on on Twitter at Alice Tweet and Instagram Alice Stewart DC. Uh, my website, you can go to alicestewart.com and, and see some of my recent clips and you can see, um, uh, you, know, you can get in touch with me there and some information on, if, you know, for, for speaking engagement. So it's, I, I, I really like to hear from people. I'm not, you know, afraid of criticism, uh, but uh, if you have something nice to say, that's, that's good too. But um, uh, that's, I, I enjoy hearing from people. And I also do a podcast with my friend, Maria Cardona. The left um, to right. Hot mics from left to right. And yeah. we talk about the issues of the day and agree to disagree. And um, we're, we're going to do an Instagram and Facebook live coming up in the next week or so. So encourage people to, um, to tune in for that. Okay. Well, I want to close like this with some thoughts. Like I said earlier on, uh, we're on different sides. You know, I've, I, I could never vote for Trump. I couldn't definitely after four years where he did it. I know that you did it. I'm not going to attack you for it. I, I can't get inside of your head. I, I couldn't do it as, as me. But the takeaway from this, folks, that I want you to see is, again, I cannot talk to people that are QAnon or that are just absolute, whether it's on the, the right or the left, because I think the too far right and I think the too far left is just, it drives me nuts. I, I just, I can't, I'm, I'm more of a centered person. This interview proved we agreed on more than we uh, disagreed. Um, you don't have to attack people. Don't get me wrong. I, if you look at my Twitter feed, I do go after people when I think they do stupid stuff. I do, I don't pull no punches. Uh, but I wanted to have you on, like I said earlier, because I've watched you. And though we disagree about the, the Trump thing. I, I do want to say one thing about policies. I, I would, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this as well. I also think that he got, and, and people are going to be shocked when I say this, but I try to be fair. I'm sure, like say a broken clock is usually right what, twice a day, I think it's the same. <laughs> I'm sure, and you would know this better than me, I don't want to spend another three hours talking about it, but that he did something, even, by, even if they slipped it in the piece of paper and they said, sign this, and it was something good for the country but he could never talk about it. He could right. never, they could never keep him on point. Like if he, like if he signed something, like regulations. I've heard from people on the, on the left, not the far left, that some of the regulations that he pulled back were actually a good thing, but you could never get him to talk about it because right. he always had to tell you how great he was and how wonderful he was. And you know, he, he got, you said it earlier, he got in, in the way of, a, he got in the way of, of, of himself in front of the policies that you, you might, whether we agree or disagree, that he did good, but he couldn't stay on point. He'd rather attack somebody on Twitter, like a, a, a juvenile child. But I commend you, like I said in the press release, you call balls and strikes, okay? People don't have to agree with your, 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 your uh, policy beliefs and all that, but I, I would like people to look at the person. 
there was nothing that I had Anthony Scaramucci on. Okay. And I saw he, that. That was good. He, he had 11 days. I went after, I, not, I don't go after, but I was hard on Anthony. We became friends after that, but you have to listen to people. Like I said, when somebody is like you, I could talk to you and I wish there was more people that, and, and I'm sure that you see them. I don't see them as much that are more like you that we could have discussions. Because right. the one thing that I want people to hear that she said, because I know people would come on her and say, Brad, she voted for Trump again. Yeah, I can't. I don't understand why she did, but she did. That's her, that's her right as an American to do that. But she also said, we didn't need four more years of this. So don't only hear what you want to hear from what Alice said. So I commend you on that. I commend you on your humanity, because that's very important to me. And people are going to say, well, she wasn't human and she voted for Trump. Okay, I hear you. You are right to have that opinion, but you also heard things. You need to listen to other things that she said that shows that there is humanity in her, that you, that you care about people. So I respect you for that. I respect the work that you, you're welcome. I respect the work that you do on CNN and I appreciate you coming on. And like I tell all of my guests, because you're all special to me in a, in a different way, you're actually the first person, I must admit this, that because Anthony was the other one that came on that was still that still voted for Trump because you know Anthony d didn't help right. uh, President Biden elected. You're the first person, but I'm glad it was you because I could have a conversation with you, even in areas where we can agree to disagree or we Thank just you. disagree. Period. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for what you're doing. <laughs> Continue. Thank you. I do have an answer to that question, though. Go if you want it. me Go to on. answer, yeah, okay. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> you you said what? Uh, no one ever asked that. Ask. You want to say? There's one person that asked this, but. Um, my last name Stewart is not my maiden name. It's not my married ex ex married name. It's um, when I was growing up, I was a fat redheaded kid, and um, you know, just always wanted to be in TV, but you know, not thinking I could actually do it. But one of my coaches, I would interview him every Monday morning. I was the sports editor for the paper, and I would interview him every Monday morning. And he would say, "Oh, here comes Pam Martin. You're going to be a big TV person one day." And he always encouraged me to follow my dreams and and have confidence and do what I wanted to do and don't listen to uh, people that are, say that you cannot achieve what you want to do. And when I finally did pay for my way through college and get my first job, I wanted a more TV name and I used his name. His name is Coach Jerry Stewart and okay. he was monumental to me. But my message is, is don't hesitate to encourage a younger person or a student or someone that <clears throat> might have a difficult time because you'll never you never know what your words of encouragement how impactful it would be on people okay so, so alice so your, your first name this that's your alice is not your first is pam now alice is alice is my name but pam martin was a big anchor in atlanta oh, at the oh, time. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> i kind of got lost because i was gonna, <laughs> i was gonna tease you because i was gonna say alice did you, did you remember Linda Lavin had the show when we were kids, Alice? And yes. my, my favorite yes. character was Flo when she said, kiss my grits. I love her. Yep. She's still alive too. Okay. Yep. Um, anything anyway. else you'd like to get out to the viewers? That's all. <laughs> okay. That's all. Well, I appreciate your time today. Again, uh, I, you have access to me. If you want to come back on, if you have a book coming out or uh, an event coming up, you got direct access to me. I'll email you my, my um, cell number as well. So you have direct access to me. Uh, be safe. Uh, as you, I want to get past this all and, and go back to uh, normal life again where we can get out and socialize and, and, and so on. But again, thank you for coming on. And everybody that's watching this, before you start leaving me comments, how can you interview a Republican, all that? Because it's my show. I can do what I want. But listen to everything. You don't have to agree with everything she said. Listen, though, to everything she said. Because that's the biggest problem I think we have in society today from all sides. People right. only hear what they want to hear. Right. They have short attention spans when they read stuff or when they hear and they want to put it in their mind. She didn't say that. No, she did say that. That's why I read quotes that you said because I didn't want to misquote you. So, right. All right. Well, again, have a great day. Thank you, Brad. It was very kind and respectful and professional. I, I enjoyed it. And thank you for, for the time. God bless. God bless you too. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, folks, that's another episode of the Bad Brad Berkowitz Show on the Ringside Report web TV channel. Now, again, make sure you subscribe to my channel. Leave your comments below. Follow me on Twitter at BadBradRSR. Again, it's at BadBradRSR. There was another guest that I found very interesting. We found some common ground. Uh, we were civil to each other. I know there's probably going to be people that leave me comments that, you know, she 
Alice voted for Trump again. How could she? That's your American right. I understand that. Just listen to everything she said, okay? No, we're, I'm not a Trump supporter. I've never been a Trump supporter. But listen to everything that she said. Because one thing that people were saying when they saw the press release was, please tell me she wasn't one of those people who would stop the steal. She wasn't. You heard it. She went on record. She works for CNN. Why would she go on record if she was for something that, uh, if she was for something and then say she was against it? So listen to our whole conversation, which I thoroughly enjoyed. She was, again, the first person that I had on that did vote for Trump again in 2020. But there was other stuff that she said. Listen to that as well. And that's what type of guest you're going to get on the Bad Brad Berkwood Show. I want diversity. It's my favorite word in the dictionary. All right, folks, forget about it, as I always say. And remember, every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. Bad Brad out.